Hello and welcome to the Ark Woman podcast. This is an exploration of womankind. Here we discuss what it is to be a woman in the modern world while utilizing ancient and modern modalities in tandem to create a bounty of health for the body, mind and spirit. G'day everyone. Welcome back to the Ark Woman podcast. This podcast is going to be a little bit different simply because I've gained a huge following in a very short amount of time and everyone has no idea what I'm about, <laughs> what my background is. I used to be able to have a really, you know, in-person community um, that was quite small for a while and now it's expanded and I felt like I've kind of needed to reintroduce myself to a lot of you very quickly, which I'm happy to do. I was going to do this video in short form on Instagram um, as I got an influx of questions about myself and who I am and my practice and where I live and all of these things, but I got so many that I think I'm just going to do a podcast slash video. Um, so yeah, I've collated all of these questions, so sorry if yours don't appear. Um, I got a lots of personal ones, so ones that were too personal for me to answer about my own life, and then I also got a, quite a few that were just too specific that I was kind of like you just need a book in with me <laughs> um, this is just very specific to what you need um, and there were also a lot of questions that were similar so if you feel like your question didn't turn up in its exact form this is the reason why because I got hundreds and hundreds and as much as I'd like to spend all of my time sitting here answering all your questions um, I have other things to do <laughs> so I'm really sorry if you felt like I didn't address what you're asking specifically and hopefully that explains why. So let's get on to the first question. How long have you been running Aquaman and what inspired you to start it? I've been running Aquaman since February this year, which is a relatively quick um, progression of business, you know, in a short amount of time, relatively. I mean, I don't know. I've never owned a business before. That might be normal. It might also not be normal. But yeah, since Feb, um, it's been quite small going. Um, I've had some incredible things happen in you know not even a year of business so far um yeah and what made me start it um i've always wanted to specialize in women's health i've always been you know a pretty pretty interested in women's health and women's bodies um which is why i named it after joan of arc because she just went after what she thought was right and um she did it even though she knew she was going to be hated for it which yeah don't go into women's health if you don't have thick skin that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> it's pretty hard out here sometimes but i did it because i love women I also did it because I felt like women were just being incredibly disenfranchised um, and ignored in the medical community. And I also saw that there was a, a significant gap in the market for someone who was bridging the allopathic and the alternative. Um, allopathic mean, meaning, like, you know, your typical medical industry and your, and your alternative, which means, you know, the hippie dippy. <laughs> meditation eating you know the things that shouldn't be hippie but are apparently and I just thought that a melding of these two worlds would be really wonderful so that's why I started Ark Woman basically because I saw a gap in the market I saw my friends and family suffering and I knew that I could help so I decided to focus on women's health where did you study and did you undergo any specific training about courses to learn about cyclical living so I studied at Murdoch University and I also studied at La Trobe University um, so I have a bachelor in health, human health and nutrition um, and then I also did a certification with the FEM Institute um, on fertility awareness method and the infradian cycle so I haven't done any any, any courses specifically on the women's cycles because that was already in my training both all of those trainings those three trainings that I did um, alongside a significant amount oh my god the chickens have arrived alongside a, and a significant amount of self-study um, reading lots of books and textbooks and being mentored beautifully by a group of gorgeous women throughout my career that I'm in, incredibly grateful for so I've done lots of training. I've done, I have lots of receipts, I would say, from various universities and institutes that I'm very grateful for that formed a really good foundation for me to go and read the scientific literature and form my own educated opinions and perspectives on this alongside working with clients. What are your big three, sun, moon and rising signs and how many dark nights of the soul do you experience a year? That is incredibly left of field. Um, okay, my sun is Taurus. My moon is Scorpio and my rising is Sagittarius, which is a mixed bag, but it works beautifully. <laughs> I 
I would like to say myself. Um, yeah, and the dark nights of the soul. I'm not sure if I really prescribe to, um, you know, the, the neo, neo alternative spirituality um, of the West too much. I wouldn't say I have a dark night of the soul. I definitely have times in the year where I say I'm really fucking up and I need to look at this part of me and accept it and move forward. If you want to call that a dark night of the soul, that's great. And if, if that's what your definition of a dark night of the soul is, then I would say I, I have 365 of them because there's at least one, one time a day where I'm like, oh, I could be doing this way better. <laughs> um, and, you know, I feel like I'm perpetually just trying to be a better human. Um, you know, I, I don't really know how to quantify that. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Where do you live and how does a rural pop property play into your role in your teaching? So I live in buttfuck nowhere, Tasmania, and that is all I'm going to say. I'm not, I've gotten a lot of questions about where are you? And I understand because where I live is really beautiful, but, um, yeah, I live, I live in the middle of nowhere, Tasmania, and that's all you're ever going to find out. Um, and how has been living in, in, in a rural area added to my teachings? That's a really beautiful question. Um, I think it's allowed me to work a little bit harder because I am closer to the environment and I don't have to drive to nature as much anymore, um, which is really beautiful and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but yeah, I think that's definitely how it's affected me. I think living more cyclically and just accepting that, you know, the human body was designed to yes be able to do incredible things but for the most part we were supposed to live in a calm and predictable environment and i think living closer to nature has really made that quite prominent to me so when women come to me and they say why can't i do hit workouts five days a week and eat vegan and you know intermittent fast i'm like well nature doesn't really work that way and it's never been as obvious to me as it is here um, living really close to nature so yeah thank you for that that was a really beautiful question i never really thought about how my environment and my practice were interwoven so tightly but ultimately they are how many chickens do you have and do they have names are you flirting with me <laughs> we have three hens at the moment wanda eve and you just saw if you're watching this episode um leah she has eight chicks leah has eight chicks we also have a rooster called patch he's just turned one he's learning how to be a dad he has no idea what he's doing we love him for it um he's incredibly loud um, he's my alarm clock. I wake up at about 5.30 on the dot every single day. Thanks, Patch. <laughs> um, our two other chickens are both roosting and they have eggs. So we will have a huge amount of chickens soon. And I don't think I want to name any of them. But, you know, Leah, Leah's ones are coming along really beautifully. They have really strong personalities. They, as you just saw, they come right up to me. They have no fear whatsoever now. Yeah, they're really beautiful. I love chooks. Never really cared about chooks kind of was a bit scared of them a couple of years ago so it's really nice to build that community with them and, and just you know I'm just looking at them playing around and scratching in the bush it's just really nice to cohabitate with them they're just gorgeous creatures animals are great they're such a gift do you pray um yeah <laughs> not a Christian way or a Muslim way or a Buddhist way um or an animist way uh I definitely I'm grateful every single day when a friend or a family member is having a hard time. I definitely put out a little line of love to them. Um, I hope for the best for myself. I'll, ma I'll make intentions for my day if, it is, if it's going to be a full-on day. But, um, yeah, the connection I have to my spirituality, I think that's really at the crux of what this question is saying, um, is, you know, I have my own type of spirituality. I wouldn't say it's, you know, your, your neo-Western white girl tarot card um, carrying around, around a rose quartz crystal. It's not like that at all. It's also not Christian. It's also not Muslim. It's a culmination of different experiences I've had. I've had the pleasure of traveling quite a lot and seeing that a lot of different religious and spiritual ideas and perspectives are more similar than they are different. And I think I've just picked up the ones that are more similar because those are ones that I think if we can agree spiritually on, you know, foundational rules, I feel like that's where I'm going to be. But yeah, that's where I am spiritually. Um, vague answer, but hey, I'm a vague person, so that's what that is. <laughs> what initially drew you to study and explore cyclical living? I think, you know, I've never really been on hormonal birth control or the, or, you know, or the implanon or any of those things, and I definitely saw a huge fallout in people around me that chose an allopathic pathway um, and then seeing that carnage around me, also being close to the health and wellness community, you know, you just see an alternative way on things. 
Um, and I just, you know, I was really drawn to it because I think women are incredibly powerful and I feel like the, the resource of womanhood is untapped. Um, and I also just thought, you know, women run the world, as Beyonce said. Um, men also run the world and we love men. Um, but I feel like women are expected to, to do a lot for little. I think we gaslight women a lot. Um, I think we don't believe women. The medical system was not made for women, nor does it support it. So, and I was passionate about this from a young age. So I saw that this was a really beautiful place for me to be and to seek myself and my business um, and how to make money ethically and, and wanted to help people basically. I have, you know, women who have PCOS and endometriosis have incredible results and it's just very fulfilling to be able to help women um, because really they are the bedrock of our society. If we help women, we just ultimately, we just make the world a better and easier and more sustainable place to live in. So yeah, broad answer, but uh, there's lots of different reasons how I could answer that question. I just love women. That's really the foundation. <laughs> Can you share your favorite recipe from your cookbook? Ooh, um, that's like me choosing one of my favorite chickens. I'm not going to do that. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is the tahini millionaire squares. Those are great. Hmm, what else? The beef burgers are really good. The, to the tofu mousse is really good. The buckwheat granola is really good too. I don't know if I can choose one, to be honest. I'm in Ludio right now, so I'm just hungry. All of them. All of them. <laughs> Does your cookbook feature ingredients that are easy to find worldwide? Yes. I traveled around the world as I was making these recipes, and I didn't know at the time that I was making them for a cookbook. I was just making them for myself and making them suited towards the infradian cycle, and I was just making it for myself. Um, and then kind of pieced it together. So it's a world cookbook. So this isn't an Australian cookbook. Um, if you haven't already noticed, I'm Australian. <laughs> this is a world cookbook. So you will find recipes from Japan, China, you know, Southeast Asia. You will find Indian recipes. You will find Australian recipes. You will find classic American. You will find other North American classics as well, as well as African, as well as South African, Mexican. It's a world cookbook. So you will be able to find most, if not all of these ingredients fairly easily. I mean, seasonally, there's always going to be challenges. You're not going to be able to find mangoes in Tasmania, just as you're not going to be able to find kale in the middle of a monsoon season in India, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, there are some limitations always, as there always is with ingredients and food. But for the most part, you should be able to find everything in this cookbook quite easily. And I designed it that way, you know, indirectly as I was doing it. So, yeah, it's a world cookbook and you will be able to find these ingredients and they are uncomplicated. I didn't want to make you go out and find some innocuous, weird starch to use once and then it sits in your cupboard forever. I've, I've done that before. I didn't want my cookbook to be like that. Um, I just want it to be basic, accessible, healthy and delightful. So yeah, that's Infradian Nourishment. I've seen that you don't support vegan diets. Why is that? I have a podcast on why I went from being vegan to eating meat again. So to answer that question, go and look at that. Um, but I don't support it because a lot of my clients, um, they have a harder time on a vegan or vegetarian diet and re meeting their health goals than if they do animal-based people. Um, when I say animal-based, I mean just eating animal protein. Um, also, I have went through, you know, hell and back with my health. And a vegan diet has a lot to fucking answer for. Um, you know, I think a lot of us got on the vegan and vegetarian train a few years ago when people on the internet told us it was completely okay to eat 14 bananas a day, <laughs> which is so ridiculous in retrospect. Um, but yeah, I'm not a proponent of vegan diets. I find them, they don't find them nutritionally dense. I find them quite, they exacerbate lots of inflammation in the body. I find that it doesn't really do well for your gut. I just think... Yeah, I'm not really a big fan of vegan diets, you know, but I'm biased. I had a bad experience on a vegan diet. So, you know, go and find someone. If you're vegan, go and find someone who's great with, you know, giving advice for vegan diets. But from from the experience that I've had and the research that I've done on from being hardcore vegan to now not being, I feel like my life experience has a lot to, to say. I think a lot of people who used to be vegan are not vegan anymore. And that also has a lot to say as well. Ancestrally, people have always eaten animals. You know, you can't separate death from life. Um, yeah, I'm just not a big supporter of it. So sorry if you're vegan or vegetarian. There's nothing against you. I just don't like the diet and what it does and, and how it's being, you know, propositioned as this cure-all because it's absolutely not. And a lot of my clients who used to be vegetarian and vegan have a huge amount of fallout 
And it just makes me really frustrated that we are still pushing a diet that is inherently unnatural, quite new, and is quite dangerous and restrictive. So, yeah. What do you recommend eating for each phase of the cycle to support hormonal health? That is a loaded question, and I actually have a resource for that called the Infradian Nourishment Chart. I'm not going to sit here and go through all the food groups and what you should be eating in different parts of the cycle. Just go and buy the chart. Sorry. (laughs) I'm not going to spend heaps of time sitting here um, and explaining that. Um, yeah, just go get that chart, I guess. You can get it online. For someone interested in hormonal health but unsure of where to start, what advice would you give them? Foundations are really, really great. A lot of the time we want to get into the nitty-gritty of hormonal health, you know, making sure that we're eating berberine and do I have PCOS and all of these things. A lot of the time it's just getting the basics, all right? So diet, eat animal foods. (laughs) That's my number one. Eat organs as well. Um, Liver is really great for women as well as if you want to be hardcore, go and eat ovaries and uterine tissue as well from cows. Desiccated, grass-fed, eat fat and eat protein. Don't be afraid of eating fat and don't be afraid of eating protein. High-carbohydrate diets are not your friend. Cut back on caffeine. Um, That messes up your estrogen levels. Make sure you're sleeping eight hours a night. Are you relaxed? Because if your central nervous system is haywire, then your whole gut is going to be haywire and that means that you're that your whole reproductive system is going to be haywire. Are you fasting all the time? If you're fasting all the time, that's not actually good for women. Are you eating when you wake up? You know, these are really simple things, but they are foundational, right? Eating lots of protein to make sure you can actually make all the building blocks in the body. Making sure that you're listening to your body is also really important. That's just the number one, really. Are you listening to your body? If you're hungry when you wake up, are you eating when you wake up? If you're tired in the afternoon, are you making sure that you're eating something sustainable in the middle of the day so you don't actually have that? Are you craving caffeine when you wake up? That means you should probably drop that because it's not healthy for you to be craving a stimulant first thing in the morning. Um, If you are tired and you want to eat heaps of beef just before your period, but instead you choose to eat a macro bowl and go to Vikram yoga, um, you know, your body's telling you one thing and you're doing another. I think a lot of the time this is actually from the root of this modern science telling women that their body is a problem to be solved and you don't know your body and you shouldn't trust it and it's just it's so mysterious it's fucking not your body is telling you exactly what it wants and is up to you to actually respect that and listen to it or not very often it's just foundational so hopefully that answers that question i mean that is a loaded question in of itself i mean there's lots of resources on my website if you wanted to go and look at that Another woman that I'd recommend is Alyssa Vitti. She's amazing as well. Um, So go and look at those resources and find some of the answers. But really, before you get into the nitty gritty biohacky style of, you know, getting, you know, when you've got like 80% of your foundation set, then the 20% of, you know, small adjustments that you can make are great. But you don't have to, don't do the 20% before you do the 80%. Make sure you're doing foundational changes. Are you eating enough? How are you eating? How do you feel about your food? Are you exercising um, effectively? Are you calm? Is your nervous system calm? Do you have a good community? Oftentimes, these foundational changes can be the best for you and they will holistically affect the body most effectively as well. Can you elaborate on your thoughts about caffeine and coffee in the context of hormonal balance? Yes. Yes, I can. And I'll be very happy to do that. So in your liver, there is an enzyme that breaks down caffeine and it also breaks down coffee. Or I shouldn't say that. It's two different enzymes, but they're made from the same part of your DNA. We're not really going to go into a full biochemistry and anatomy session right now. But basically, your DNA codes for proteins. And there is a protein that makes an enzyme. An enzyme is something that either puts things together or breaks things apart, right? So if you're having a cup of coffee in the morning and you're about to get your period, your liver is going to be preoccupied making an enzyme to break down caffeine when it should be breaking down estrogen so you get your period adequately. So if you're experiencing PMS, if you have really heavy periods, if you have cramping, if you have acne, these are all signs of estrogen dominance, right? And if you're drinking a lot of caffeine in the morning or at any time in the day in your pre-workouts, you f- very often you'll find them in protein powders, Sometimes you find them in muesli bars. Just make sure that you're keeping an eye on that because cold admittedly, throughout the day, a lot of women are eating and drinking huge amounts of caffeine and I'm not a big fan of this, just from this position, right? 
it's hugely stimulating for your nervous system as well which i don't think is good for women all throughout their cycle there are lots of different types of herbal stimulants like brahmi and cacao that you could be entertaining instead if you need an alternative so yeah basically caffeine disrupts your estrogen digestion in your liver um, so if you're experiencing any of these symptoms and you're drinking a lot of coffee, my suggestion would be to use the alternatives that I just suggested and just backing off a little bit and seeing if the symptoms get better. If they do, then you've found your problem. I don't think caffeine is great for women all the time, if not everyone all the time. There's lots of evidence either way. I mean, we can get into the nitty gritty of it, but I think that would bore everyone to death, quite frankly. But yeah, just from a hormonal perspective, that's what I think of caffeine. How do you integrate seed cycling into your routine and how has it benefited you personally? Great question. I don't seed cycle necessarily, but I, I cycle my entire food system. So for each of the four phases, follicular, ovulatory, luteal and menstrual, I eat completely different meats, legumes, nuts, seeds, fruits and vegetables. I don't just seed cycle. I've been cycling my entire food system to my infradian cycle for about two to three years now and it's phenomenal i mean i can't really separate out the seed cycling i've never done that alone um i feel like if i just did seed cycling alone i would feel a negative <laughs> impact because it wouldn't be nutritionally what i need at that part of the cycle i mean women experience huge positive benefits of seed cycling but if you're going to seed cycle you may as well just do the whole hog do the whole lot just do the entire cycle um, and you'll find that it's really effective. So to answer your question half-heartedly, yeah, I think it's really great, but that's just because I do all of my foods, not just the seeds and the nuts. How often do you use your yoni egg when what benefits have you observed? I use my yoni egg every couple of days. Ideally, I want to be using it every day, but like time is of the essence of late. Um, the garden is bursting. There are chickens popping out everywhere. My business is booming and just, you know, generally life in spring in Tasmania is just a little bit busy because everyone's been hibernating for a while. That was a bit of a sidetrack. Um, I use it every second day. The benefits I've observed are pretty wonderful. You know, I have a more toned vaginal canal. I have more powerful orgasms. Um, you know, my sexual pleasure is definitely heightened because when you exercise the vaginal canal, you are allowing more blood flow into the area that's feeding all the nerve fibers there, which, so, which means your sensorium is just enhanced tenfold. So my orgasms and my self-pleasure and my just connection to my vagina has been so beautiful and so different. When you just go into your yoni to put like fingers or a penis or a toy or a tampon or a yoni cup in, it, it can, I don't know, I think it's just, it creates this transactional numb relationship. But when you go in, to your reproductive system with an intention of loving it and healing it for no other reason than I love you and I want to do this for you and for me and for us. I just think the relationship that I have with my yoni is beautiful and, you know, isn't this transactional numb thing anymore. It's beautiful and flourishing and, yeah, from a spiritual perspective and from a, you know, a connection perspective, it's created lots of different change. Um, but that's just me. It might be different for everyone. The journey from, you know, when I first started to where I am now has not been linear whatsoever. There have been periods of numbness and pain and tension. And now I feel like I've gotten to a really beautiful place with my reproductive system and my yoni as a whole. Um, I think we're very at peace with each other, which is really nice. And yoni egg has been an incredible practice throughout all of that. How do you balance your time between online work and your social life and your own life? Um, <laughs> It's kind of intertwined um, at the moment, you know, especially because the women I'm interviewing on my podcast are also friends, you know, where I work is also my home. Um, a lot of the time, the people I'm hanging out with have been to my events or are also my clients. So it's a little bit mixed and it doesn't really seem like there's a separation between work life and social life and personal life at the moment. But I don't actually think this is a bad thing because I really love what I do. I love the women I work with and work for. Um, yeah, so it's really great. It feels like a gift that, you know, my social life and my work life have become intertwined. You know, that might be a, a negative in the long run, but for right now, um, they feed each other and they feed into each other and they cannot exist with, without one another. Um, and I just think that's also the terrain of just working with women. It's a relational thing. Some of my clients that I've never actually met in person have become great friends and I care about them deeply. Um, 
yeah, I just think my line of work is very personable and sociable and down to earth. And I don't think, a, you know, a transactional, you know, boundaried relationship with my work and with my life was ever going to be realistic for me. Do you work online? And if so, where can people find more of the information on your courses? I do work online. 95% of my work is online, apart from the 5%, which is the red tent that I run every month where I live. Um, and then online, most of the part. Courses, I don't have any courses right now. You might be referring to my bootleg, bootleg fertility course. Um, I stopped that recently. That was just kind of a trial period before I actually make the the beautiful, fancy, on the website, login situation. Um, the courses will be released next year. And that is completely up to you guys. If you want a fertility awareness method one, if you want a cycle syncing one, if you want a detox off the pill one, it's really up to you what you want and I will make it. Um, eventually, by the end of next year, I will have about five or six courses that will run interchangeably um, that you can sign up for and you can get lots of information from. But that will be on arcwoman.com.au if you're looking for that in the future. What are you most passionate about in Arcwoman at the moment? I think connection. It's really great to connect with lots of different people all over the world. I am shocked at how quickly this thing has grown. Um, and it's really cool just to get people's messages and say, like, I've really connected with this post or thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, every single message I, I get, I hopefully I have replied to. I really appreciate everyone's love. I find it a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Um, but connection really is the main thing, sitting down with people on my couch, um, you know, harvesting herbs from my garden to give to women to, for them to steam with. Ultimately, every element of Aquaman is about connection and education. The other part I find really uplifting is the fact that this foundational knowledge that I'm sharing with women is going to allow them to have a better and easier and more joyful time with their body and ultimately be able to connect with their body more. So yeah, to answer that question really is just the connection. I just really love that part of it and the community part of it um, has just been really phenomenal and is the reason why I do it. What does hormone harmony mean when you use that term? Okay, so a lot of the time I hear people say hormonal balance and that is applicable to men because they have a hormonal balance because it doesn't really change. <laughs> Women's do, especially if you're a menstruating woman, um, it's changing all the time. You know, your hormonal system changes from 20 to 30% between some days of your cycle, which is phenomenal because if your hormones change, then your whole body changes because hormones affect every single cell in your body. So that's really phenomenal. And I say hormone harmony because your reproductive system and your central nervous system and your gut and your brain and your heart and your muscle system and your fat storage system, all, all of these different systems and your immune system in your body are holistically connected. They are intertwined inextricably. And I think it's the most beautiful system in the world. And I also just don't think there is much balance to it. I think there's definitely harmony. And I think there's also communication and connection. I don't think, you know, this idea of balance, when we say balance, we think of, you know, something balancing and staying linear and level. That's not what the female body is about. It's a cyclical nature. And so hormonal harmony is how are these hormones talking to each other? How are they interacting with each other? What reactions and responses are actually manifesting in the body? Is this healthy? Is this unhealthy? What can we do to buffer the system? That's a more interesting conversation to have about the female body because essentially that's what's happening. Where is the main source of your recent influx of followers coming from? How has that impacted your engagement with your community? The main source of my recent influx of followers, I had a book released in, in Freudian Nourishment a month ago, and that was a number one bestseller on Amazon, and that caused an influx of followers. But the most recent influx of followers I experienced was from a couple of videos of mine going viral, um, whatever the fuck that means. Um, a few of them have a million or I think five to six million views. I've stopped looking. Um, it's impacted my community significantly because it's created one <laughs> um, that was not there um, which is really interesting because it happened very quickly and I've spoken to a few friends about how bizarre it was because I went from you know 3,000 to having now 41,000 followers on Instagram all of these people listening to my Insta um, my podcast all of these people subscribing to my YouTube channel getting an influx of you know consults and people um, lots of, you know, my red tent selling out, a lot of these things happening in an instant. So 
it's impacted it just by simply the creation of it, which is exciting and also a bit overwhelming. I remember talking to really close friends of mine and saying, this was not at all what I wanted or expected, but it is here now and people pray for this. So I'm going to be very grateful. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, it's definitely new. I don't know if it's impacted my community so much because there's nothing to impact. It's quite new, um, which is cool because it's really up to the people who, I don't even like the word follow. I, it's such a weird concept. Um, the people that are interested in my work, it's up to really them to integrate with me and figure out what everyone wants, how I can help you and how we can all move together collectively. That's really what I'd like for this community, essentially. All right, I said I wasn't going to answer any personal questions, but there are a couple here that I found interesting um, that I wanted to answer because a lot of the questions were similar. So I'm just going to answer two. So sorry, everyone else, but that's just how that cookie is going to crumble. I don't have time to answer a million questions. I'm really sorry. If you have any questions, please just book in with me on my website and then we can just talk for ages. Um, okay, so the first one is I work night shifts while using the fertility awareness method when should I take my temperature or how should I optimize my routine for hormonal health during irregular work hours so when someone asks me about basal body temperature and I'm waking up at weird hours or I got sick and my temperature is all over the place what this really tells me is that someone has not educated themselves sufficiently nor has been taught sufficiently about fertility awareness method there are four biomarkers that you can go off of when you're using fertility awareness method. Number one is cervical mucus. Number two is cervical placement. Number three is luteinizing hormone testing or ovulation kits. And number five is, uh, number four, sorry, is basal body temperature. So at any point in your life, you should be using two of these, if not three of them, to make sure that you're using fertility awareness method adequately. If you're just using one, I would argue that this is not fertility awareness method because you're only using one biomarker. You should be using two, if not three, just to be super, super safe. Your body is always in change, right? So if you're doing irregular work hours and you're waking up at a weird time and you don't trust that biomarker anymore, you're absolutely correct. I wouldn't be trusting that biomarker anymore. Um, I would be going off cervical mucus, cervical placement. And if you really want to be careful, doing some um, testing, some ovulation tests as well. Um, I have clients who have HPV um, who cannot use cervical mucus because it's the same all the time. I have women who can't use basal body temperature for this reason. I have women who can't use luteinizing hormone tests because they're PCOS and it's always high all the time. You should be able to use fertility awareness method at any point in your life. It really is depending on how you're being taught if that's a, and if that's actually effective. So really what this question is reflecting is I haven't been taught or I haven't actually educated myself efficiently on fertility awareness method. And to me, that's a big risk factor because you could get an unwanted pregnancy, um, which is not ideal. So hopefully that answers your question. Have you encountered any specific challenges when helping clients with PCOS and how have you addressed them? PCOS is, it is a metabolic disorder. I actually have a podcast and a blog post specifically about this. So if you have PCOS and you're listening to this or you're watching this, go and watch and, li and, you know, watch and listen and read those resources because they are interesting. Um, how we think about women's bodies as, you know, the reproductive system is over here and the metabolic system is over here and, the, you know, the central nervous system is here. It's not. They're all connected and they are, you know, it's very obvious in a woman when one thing is out of whack, they're all out of whack. So PCOS is not complicated. Very often it is a supplement. We look at supplements. We look at how we're treating the body, how we're eating. Very often we're going on a, you know, more ketogenic or high fat diet. And we're also looking at gut health. But overall, I don't think PCOS is, you know, hard to overcome. Um, it can take time. It can be tumultuous. It can be really frustrating at times and, you know, can elicit quite a lot of shame because you have hair in places you don't want it growing and then the hair you want it growing in is, is it's not growing there. <laughs> um, and you are eating more than other people. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting disease because it's affecting a lot of different women um, and it's affecting them in different ways. But yeah, PCOS, I've had multiple clients with PCOS come to me and have great results. Um, one of the kind words sections on my Instagram and on my website is specifically from someone called Veda or Meg, um, who said that after four days after having a consult with me, she has never felt so much energy in her life and she fell pregnant um, within a month. So if that doesn't answer that question, I don't know what does. 
All right. Hopefully that answered everyone's questions. There were so many. I'm sorry if I couldn't get to yours, but I would be sitting here forever. Um, if you have any other questions that you'd like to reach out to me about, please don't be afraid to DM me on Instagram. You can also email me through the contact form of my website, www.arkwoman.com.au. And before we leave, let's just mention this gorgeous rug that I am sitting on. This is a Drift Surf Coat rug. It is a project of One Day. One Day is an amazing organization that is aiming to get women from women's shelters into their own lives and supporting them along that journey. One Day is going to be doing incredible things in the next few years. It's led by two incredible women I love so much. They support Indigenous artists, which is great for me. Um, this is beautiful. I have two of their rugs. They also have a sale on at the moment. It's Woman 10 at checkout. So Woman, W-A-W-O-M-A-N, one zero. It's late in the day. My brain is fading. I'm in the luteal phase, if you haven't noticed already. <laughs> I love you all. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.